All right. Happy Thursday to everybody. We are here with Dan Roma from Perilous, and we've got Shane Lee in the house, and we've got Dream Media, a new channel partner for Audioholics. Welcome, Zach. Welcome, Kellen. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Awesome. Glad to be here, Gene. Thank you. Glad to have you. Um, I want to give a little introduction to Dan. It's been a while since you've been on our channel, Dan. Dan is a audio war hero. He's been in the industry for decades designing some of the best audio equipment you probably don't realize for many of the brands that you love. Dan decided to take it on his own now and come up with this really upscale company called Perlisten, and he's doing some innovative work. As you guys have seen in the past, our first review of their product was the S7T Tower. That was the flagship of the day and james larson who was a very pragmatic reviewer absolutely gushed over the speakers because of the way not just because of the way they measured but just because of how clean they sounded how well they responded in a room that's when i decided i had to get a pair in my house as a reference and dan appreciate you sending me those speakers and today we're going to focus on i guess it's called you guys call it a limited edition i call it a hot rod version of the s7t yeah. I want Dan to kind of give us a rundown of all the upgrades that go into that speaker and um, what you're getting for it. And the fact that it's a limited production, I think you said you're only making what 50 pairs. Of yeah, this we're going to limit it to 50 pairs. And, and that's largely because the, the amount of labor we're going to have to put into it here in the States, um, you know, I'm going to hand measure each one using the clipple system, um, use that to pair match. Uh, to as tight of a tolerance as we've ever done um, and then provide that data. And that's, you know, that's to do a pair of speakers. That's a, at least a day's worth of work. Um, uh, so that's a real, a real task to take on. And, and so we decide, yeah, we want to do this, but we'll limit it to the 50 pair and then make it as, as special as we can. Hence the so just to give you guys an idea, one thing I, that really impressed me with the brand is, as you guys know, I have this pair in my family room system. These are the S70s, just the regular versions. And I did some in-room measurements. And this is the left and right speaker at the main listening position. And this is in the room. And look at how close they match. I mean, I've, it's very hard to get a passive speaker to match this well. And you can see this is all of the measurements across all four of my seats, an eight-foot listening area. And it's incredibly linear and consistent, um, and it hits the, the, the predictive curve that you would get for a speaker that has good axial performance in an anechoic chamber. So that's impressive, and that's the regular version. So, Dan, what's involved in getting a speaker to match that well? I'd imagine you have to be doing some serious crossover work and having some tight tolerance, not only in the parts, but even in the driver mechanics as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. Everything in, in the chain is required to they get that kind of matching and we do on the regular s7 we're already our pair matching um which is a big a big part of that uh, the s series um but yeah you start you know we do the designs of the drivers every component is designed in-house um so that's part of it um but then controlling the manufacturing we do the drive units uh woofers tweeters mids everything um even the crossovers we build all in-house and so now you're you're checking the 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 tolerances on each part in the chain. And then when you put the product together, um, the chances of it meeting your, your standard is already elevated. And then you just do the QC that you need to do online to do the pair matching, which, which brings them even tighter. Right. So there's not just pair matching. That's a benefit for this new version of the speaker. You also, you also did some work on the woofer to extend the linear, to extend the linearity or the excursion of the woofer, right? Yeah. I mean, the, so the, the evolution of this product started as, you know, we offer a lot of different wood finishes to the speaker. We were thinking, okay, let's do, let's do a carbon fiber version. And that sounded pretty cool. And, and then, which is what I love about Perlisten is internally, we just started throwing things around and it's like, well, why don't we, why don't we up our game a little bit since, you know, we have a little list of improvements we could do um, over the S7 and the S series as a whole. And that's what morphed it into what it is now. So then, as you alluded to, the, the drivers are new. Um, we've changed the waveguide, not the not the dispersion pattern, but how we use it. Um, and then uh, the, the isoacoustics Gaia feet, and then the um, how we're handling the crossover, the precision, and the pair matching. So it's quite a bit, quite a bit. And going back to the woofers, that's yeah. that's 
the big jump in the performance where I, I revisited that woofer design and and the motor structure is where and actually i'll grab one i got one here yeah we want to see one of these this is audio porn to us <laughs> yeah so um you can see the copper here and that that alludes to what's going on on the inside so i redid the voice coil design um changed changed the windings um change the uh, shorting rings internally um, to lower the inductance even more. more. Um, so it's, it's a little bit lighter, lower inductance, um, but it's got 20% more linear throw, which is, which is a huge step. Um, and then because of that, I thought, okay, let's, let's look at the, the heat management of the whole speaker, um, starting with the woofers. And that, this is copper, and it's coupled with the, the copper screws to a giant heat sink on the inside right along the, the coils of the uh, voice coil. So it's, mm. it's pulling um, it's the heat, you know, through conduction out, but then it's hard to see, but there's actually a, a seam right there where the convection, the air flows past the coil and out past the heat sink. So it's a whole different way of cooling the driver while it's, while it's in motion. How big is the voice call on that driver? Is it two it's, inch? It's a, no, it's a, it's inch not that half. big. It's a 32 millimeter. Right. And so, um, the way I design the drivers, um, I focus on the mass, the linear excursion, and the sensitivity. Um, and so as you go wider in diameter, sure, you can increase the power handling, but the weight gets out of control pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so you use aluminum wire, so you end up with inherently bigger wire. So it's going to handle more power just by by the use of the aluminum versus copper um, yeah, because you end, up with a, you end up with a bigger wire gauge. Yep. And, yeah. it's, and then it acts like a heat sink. Um, and then when you have a long winding, instead of going wide, the voice call spreads the heat. So uh, you can get away with smaller diameter and, and get a ton of power handling. And then the benefit is you haven't ruined the speaker by creating a very high inductance, heavy heat sink. So you, you extend the bandwidth of the driver, essentially. Yeah, you do. You do uh, without giving up the sensitivity. Um, and that's yeah. the key when you're hitting 92 dB, um, but you still want bass, right? So has the speaker been has the speaker been retuned to to accommodate the extra excursion, or is it still the same tuning as the so regular? The, yeah, so the it the low frequency tuning has changed a little bit, but really where it is, it's how the driver is reacting to the cabinet and the tuning. The cabinet's a little bit bigger, tuning's slightly different, but the benefit is 80 hertz down, where we're getting uh, one to two dB across that entire band. So we're just getting a little more bass um, in in the natural response. But then at the same time, now with the 20% more excursion, now the dynamic capability at all those frequencies is going to be that much more than, than the current one, which is right. what already. Now, what about the faceplate on the tweeter array? I, that, I think I, I read that that's aluminum now instead of plastic. So that itself acts as a heat sink for the drivers. Yeah. And that, that kind of, you know, Steven, uh, one of our partners does the amplifier designs and, and he's all, he's all about managing the heat flow in, in the, uh, in the amplifier design and i was thinking about it with the with the array um the vocals and and all the mids and the highs are handled by the dpc array and they already have heat sinks on the inner village drive units but they're only so big and i was thinking well why don't we couple those heat sinks to one giant heat sink then they're all held at the same temperature and then they have even that much more thermal capacity uh sounds like overkill but that's kind of what we're going for um mm -hmm. so that that waveguide is the same geometry that's in the current S7, but now it's it's milled out of aluminum billet. Right. Now, are you guys planning to do a limited edition on any of the other speakers in the S series, or is it just going to be uh, for the S7T? Uh, strictly the S7T. Yep. yep. That's all I'm willing to commit to building here right now. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be measuring speakers all day long and matching them. This is true. <laughs> um, but yeah. Just the S7 right now. So Dan, really quick, can you top to bottom just again, so maybe Gene and Shane can clip it, because um, this is a question that we get asked a lot are, what are the main differences? We've talked about the different materials, but just real quick, top to bottom, you know, I, I see the flight case back there behind you. I know yeah. they're gonna ship in those. So just, can you go over every single thing that's gonna be different between just the, I won't say the regular S7Ts, yeah. but just your flagships, to the special editions or limited editions. Yeah, so some of it, I'm gonna try and spin this so we can see. You should it. pick that up, Dan. You shouldn't be, yeah. you shouldn't be moving it. Physically pick it up. up. <laughs> um, 
So <laughs> you said top down, but I spun it to the back now, and you might be able to see it. Um, the inputs here, we've we've updated the inputs. Obviously, they're they're giant overkill uh, binding posts, but you see the the plate here now on the back, and that's by design. Um, so I can access that when I'm here, open it up. And then if there's any uh, modifications to the crossover to get the pair matching tighter, I'll do it there. So I won't have to take the whole speaker apart. Um, and that's, you know, that's a key difference to the current S7 where everything's buried inside and you really can't do anything like that. Um, then we already talked about the woofers in uh, pretty good detail. Uh, that's a big jump, honestly, to get that kind of performance out of an already uh, really well performing driver is, is a is a big jump. So that took the better part of half a year to come up with a, a new driver that could perform better and not lose the sensitivity. Um, then the panels, you know, it's really hard to see. I apologize, but yeah. we've got some pretty good photos. The the art carbon fiber um, over HDF. HDF is how we build the cabins always, um, but now we've by by geometry and by adding the carbon fiber, it's even that much stiffer. Um, again, it's, it's overkill, um, which we're going for. Um, yeah, then the heat sink and the waveguide, um, the thermal management of the three domes together, um, that's a big step. And then the base is actually now a thicker plate of steel. It's, um, it's 20 millimeters thick, so it's about 40 pounds um, with the isoacoustics in it. Part right here. So this is one of our early protos that we've worked with isoacoustics on. Um, it's based on their Gaia one, uh, which is rated up to 220 pounds. And it's, it's got the, uh, the isolation and the damping characteristics, um, added that to the base as well. Uh, so it's a pretty good step up from an S7. And it raises the tweeter level up a little bit too, because now you're on an isolation uh, platform. Shane and I both kind of came to the same conclusion. We noticed that yes, the speaker is angled, uh, the S7T and the R7Ts, but because the tweeter level is a little lower than most conventional speakers, like the ones I have behind me where the tweeter is really high up, the sound stage is a little different when you do A-B comparisons. So I think getting that tweeter level up a little bit with the Gaia's might raise that sound stage just a little bit more, which is, which I think is a good thing depending on your seat height. Agreed. I, I've had similar feedback and similar experiences, especially at uh, trade shows like at Expona, uh, the seating was rather close to the to the speakers, so we just uh, used the adjustment on the foot to tilt it back another one or two degrees, and exactly what we found out too, it raised the sound stage a bit. Um, this will like, inherently be higher off the ground to begin with, and then you'll still have the same range of adjustment uh, to tweak it. So, could someone that already owns an S seven T or an R seven T can they buy the custom Gaia feet from you? Uh, at this point, no. Um, we haven't put that in motion. Actually, haven't really thought about doing that. Might be a good idea. <laughs> the problem is, the, it, to talk about that in a little more detail, the problem is, uh, and I can tell this again, is that the foot is actually designed to work with this specific base, not the S7 base. The There's companies. actually a counter bore in there to take up part of the foot because the foot is pretty pretty tall. That base is upgraded from the older S7 T2. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. The current S7 is like 12 millimeters thick, if I remember right, 12 to 15, and then this is 20. It's massive. It's 40 plus pounds. Would you say that those are those are more directed for a two-channel setup, or can you actually use them in a home theater setup? And are they timbre matched to the other speakers in the system? Yeah, so the timbre matching, we, we have our um, house uh, curve, if you will, family of curves, the way I like to explain it. Um, and when we do the trainings, we talk about how the S7 was, was the starting point. And then every product in the S series, we, we follow that same formula, if you will. Um, and that, that design is, is meant for how a speaker reacts with the room to create the highest fidelity possible. And that's truly the statement. It's, and, it doesn't matter if it's high fire or home theater. And that's truly our philosophy is that a great speaker will work great for different genres of music, hi-fi, home theater. And then of course for home theater, then 
having it match the rest of the S series, you can use these with your center channel, your surrounds and, and whatnot and get as good of tamper matching as possible. Yeah. So Zach, I have a question for you since you haven't spoken much yet. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What was the uh, thought process behind picking up per listen? Uh, Cause you're basically, as far as I know, the, uh, the, the premier online retailer now of per listen. What, what drove you to do that? Yeah, thanks for asking. So we already have a lot of amazing brands that we currently offer, but this particular brand uh, per listen was brought to my attention by Kellen. So I actually feel like Kellen should answer this uh, question. Okay, there we go, Kellen. Well, uh, I thanks uh, thanks Zach for putting me on the spot, but uh, no, I, I just uh, was actually I first heard the in wall versions. Um, of the Perlison speakers. And um, I was there calibrating a customer's Trinov and, and had the uh, opportunity to listen to them there first. And um, they just sounded in simply incredible. Um, just a lot of the things that I loved in the speaker, um, you know, the clarity, the detail, um, they just, they, they sounded phenomenal. And at that, and at that time, um, it had been I think still the best in-wall speaker that I had heard in a system and uh, really just digging into it more um, with Dan's background um, and everything like that. Uh, I started to look into the brand a little over a year ago, but then actually had the chance to hear them a few months back. And since then, you know, been to a couple of different trade shows now of hearing the R series as well, um, the subwoofers, and things like that. Um, the, the, the brand as a whole, I think is, is appetizing. They make a very well measuring sounding speaker, um, especially for my uh, profile of, of how I like things to sound. And then just the, uh, I mean, it's not a bad speaker to look at either. So um, I think it just hit a lot of things on different marks and we really didn't have a high, hi-fi brand so to speak that could deliver a good two channel as well as home theater experience uh, top to bottom um, with you know surrounds in walls their own subs um, a lot of brands may do good towers but they don't do good in walls they may do good in walls but they don't make good subs so just as a whole um, i think for everything that we were trying to do here at dream media um, per listen fit the bill and um, yeah extremely happy that they came on board cool yeah thanks for sharing kellen so he, kellen initially came to me with uh per listen like he said about a year ago and my first thought was oh my gosh we you know can't bring on another brand right now but he kept pushing um and you know told me he heard it in a customer's home theater and then i was like all right i'm determined to hear these speakers at expona um and after that i was like oh my gosh we have to onboard this manufacturer. And I, I think uh, it's just a really cool brand. You guys are great people building a great speaker and they're very sexy. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. <laughs> I appreciate the kind words. So, so Dan, do you think that this, uh, I'm just curious, this metal faceplate on the tweeter thing is intriguing to me because I like, I love thermal management. I did some of that when I was an engineer back in the day. Um, is that going to become a standard thing going forward after the limited edition series runs out? Are you I going to be it's, a, it's a running change? Well, that I don't know for sure, but um, like you've, Gene, you've seen our crossovers, right? Yeah, and, we, and, we, and we do the pretty serious resistors with the aluminum casing yep. um, and very high precision. Um, I think in loudspeaker design, I've seen it time and time again. Um, it's one of the things that the designers don't think about. They don't think about the heat. They don't think about um, if you're watching a, a long movie and you're playing with significant level, um, there's going to be heat because eventually you're going to saturate um, the, the heat sink and the components, things like that. Uh, and I've seen over the years a lot of failures of transducers, certainly tweeters, probably the number one. And then yeah. even just components um, from capacitors to resistors <laughs> in there. Um, it happens all the time. across the room. I, we have to laugh. There's a guy that is, he's like an ambulance chaser. He wants to upgrade everybody's speaker. Ah, uh, okay. Hey, everybody. <laughs> that's cool. But anyway, so that that's a long way to answer the question of okay, now what are we doing with the uh, 
the heat sink on here. Well, when we run the power test and we run very serious, we, it's a full day. It's a 24 hour test using pig noise, right? And it it will stress mechanically all the drivers. But then, then the next level is what what are the thermal capabilities of the, of the entire speaker, everything in the chain. And we notice the the uh, the face plates, especially on the three tweeters, getting really really hot, um, like to the touch. And so I'm like, well, let's, let's take a massive heat sink, um, and couple them together and, and it's going to be as good as it can get now. So, so whether or not we apply that to everything, um, at some level we are, um, and then it'll probably f just fit the, the price level of our product line. You know, here we're at the flagships, we're doing as much as we can. Um, and then each will be somewhat diluted. So what's the net output increase from this speaker versus a regular S7T? Like I know the S7T is dominus rated, so it could play very low distortion to 117 dB. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not targeting any difference in that. I'm not gonna um, uh, rate it any higher. I'm still gonna recommend it at the same power levels. Where you're gonna see the benefit is then at the low frequency where you are getting more SPL below 100 hertz, below 80 hertz. I think I said. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's where you're going to see it. And then what the distortion levels are at all those levels, we're going to see another, another layer of improvement over the S7. Um, yeah. 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 You know, I've always said this, I think, um, I think the future is really all active and I think we're starting to see companies go into that and I hope eventually you do that. But as far as passive speakers, you guys have come as close to active with a passive crossover that I've ever seen in any speaker. I mean, the way they measured in my room, I don't get a measurement like that in most past, pretty much any passive speakers I've had. It's always been, I had to have active speakers with incredible EQ tuning capability to get that. What do you think about the future for Perilous? And do you guys think you're going to be eventually getting into the DSP speaker design? So we have, a, you know, consulting was our background, right? And we've done, we, the, the collective team have done a lot of DSP a lot of active products over the years and the way we develop um you know one would like to think there's a research and depart development report department and then a product development department but really it's merged and you can't you can't separate the two so we always have in parallel that r d happening um so basically what i'm saying is we've already started that chain it's just a matter of when in my opinion when we kick it into a product um formally uh, and what that product is, um, we definitely have the the chops to do it, and, and we have quite a bit of uh, unique ideas, like the beam forming that we do here. Mm -hmm. uh, now you can really unlock a lot of cool stuff with that, with the active side. Um, you know, it, it, it's the sky's the limit what you can do. Um, so, stay tuned. I guess is the best answer to that. When are we gonna get some? <laughs> when are we gonna get some in ceiling speakers from you? Ah, yeah, that's coming this fall. So it uh, lo looks like availability will be October. We're going to have three um, three variants on the in-ceiling. Um, there's going to be an S-series, S3i is what we call it, and then there's going to be an R3i, so it's 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 little brother. And then the uh, there's going to be an R2. Both the S3 and the R3 are going to have the extruded aluminum enclosure, kind of like our in-malls. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the R2 will be... Um, without the enclosure and obviously a, a, a lower price point. And this is for Atmos basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they will be, um, the, the S3 will be like a THX ultra level LCR, um, and then a Dominus level surround. So it fits perfectly in the S series, um, lineup. Um, our series will be very similar performing that quite as much output capability. Um, and they are too, of course, probably more for uh, the, lo the lower cost per listen in theaters and then for the whole house distributed. Okay. Someone's asking about the DB efficiency. We already spoke about that. I, I don't think there's a difference. The uh, sensitivity is the same on the S7T sure. limited versus the regular, right? So right. 92 yeah. DB, I think. Yeah, so, ex exactly. That's what that will be right at the a similar sensitivity to the, the current S7. The driver, the woofer itself is actually just slightly more efficient, um, but we won't be targeting a different uh, overall sensitivity for the speaker. Okay, gotcha. 
cool comment here, American design or small speaker, but insane subwoofer is beautiful. All right. Um, Shane, you, know, you have any are, questions? You no. Know, yeah. I've always, how's my mic? Is it sound okay now? Thank you. Now yeah. I'm not getting blown out. <laughs> you know, I've always been a little bit bewildered because, you know, I love your speaker so much that uh, I wish I could have a per listen system in my theater, but I've been a little bit held back because you guys don't offer matte finish. I would like to have something not so beautiful that's just matte that disappears into my room, absorbs light. Why is there no matte finish? Ah, so uh, great question. Excellent. Put me on the spot, right? So uh, <laughs> the R series, the, the uh, initial concept was going to be matte finish and all the feedback we got was to make it high gloss black. And that's why we came out with it. Um, and what's funny is, uh, in my other experiences, the, the, the matte black it's there, but it never sells anywhere near the, the high gloss black. So it's kind of one of those, we're, we're not trying to ignore that, but until the demand is really there for it, um, we may not stock it. Of course we can make those as special order cause we do do that, but that's usually, uh, the special orders are usually as, some veneer, right? Um, some wood finish. Oh. We can make you a special pair, Shay. There you go. <laughs> Would you say? I thought the I thought the R series had a matte a matte black finish. That didn't they have an? Just R? the. Uh, you're right because uh, we, you know, James may have seen some when he's been here because we we had samples of everything, and I I may have even shown some uh, from time to time. Um, but no, not in our standard production. We were doing only high gloss black and high gloss white. Um, and high gloss white wasn't the original intent either, but we had a lot of demand um, internationally for sure. And then in the US, the, the white has really picked up. It's it's crazy to think, but um, we're selling a significant amount now in the USA. Wow. Well, I know for us here at Dream Media, you know, one of the things that was intriguing about Per Listen is it is meant to make a statement piece in the room. You know, it's it's art. So I think you're on the right track with all of these beautiful finishes. For everybody watching this, you can head over to our website to see all of the gorgeous finish options. This special or limited edition model is above and beyond. I mean, it reminds me of like a high performance uh you know, Lamborghini, Ferrari, something like that. It's it's gorgeous. You guys really knocked it out of the park. What is the buying experience like if you're buying one of these limited editions? Is it they just get shipped to you in the regular carton or do you hand deliver these yourself or set them up for the potential <laughs> buyer? Yeah, Eric, Eric's here in the office somewhere. He's going to hand deliver and set them up for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the flight case is right here. So each speaker will come in the flight case like that. Um, and if you're in the US, uh, we're going to plan and ship from here um, to the dealer um, where whoever ends up buying it gets it. Uh, and then they'll come from here internationally to all of our partners across the world. Um, and then dealer to dealer will handle the individual buying experience. Yeah, so this is part of our Dream Media Plus program machine, which means that the customers are going to receive white glove treatment um, whenever they purchase this product. Very nice. You, you know, I've got some, uh, I know I've heard that you've worked with M&K in, in the past. Like I have some M&Ks on my desk right now still for my desktop monitoring uh, when I'm editing videos. Would you sell, would you say from all the way from the beginning till now, this is your pinnacle design? Like there's been nothing better that you've ever designed in the past? Yeah. I would, I would. And that's, that's, I think we were chatting about that at the beginning. Um, that's my philosophy. Each, each project you're trying to make as good as it can be, but it's also kind of a sum of your experiences as a designer. So each, that's why you like the new challenge is because then you can apply what you learn and take it to the next level. <laughs> and that was per listen. That was kind of the concept behind per listen as a whole, as a brand was, uh, you know, all these propeller heads are, are like, let's make something really cool. Um, and then you get done with it. And you're like, well, now I got another list of ideas to do. And and that's that's what keeps us going. And that's why for listen so fun to be a part of is that I don't see that stopping anytime in the near future. Awesome. But Can at this point, to answer the question directly, yes, absolutely. This is the top. <laughs> can you just explain? Uh, can you explain? the three tweeter array or the the whole middle section there with the tweeter mid-range what exactly is beam forming and why should you have it what does it do 
Okay. Uh, the way I like to explain it is you start with a conventional tweeter, right? And so um, that tweeter has pros and cons, right? So um, one of the con or a couple of the cons of that design or limitations of that design is that at the lower end of a normal dome tweeter, it's going to have very wide dispersion. At the higher end, it's going to start beaming and, and then everything in between. Um, but typically can sound pretty good when it's used within its bandwidth. Other limitations are going to be how much you can use it at low frequency. So it's already you can say that's not, that's not ideal. Adding a waveguide um, creates a lot, tackles a lot of those cons and creates a lot of performance enhancements. The waveguide now allows you to control the dispersion pattern horizontally, vertically, over a much wider bandwidth. So now we've, we've got huge improvements. Also, you can extend it a little bit lower in frequency and or lower the distortion. You use it how you, how you want as a designer, but those two, it unlocks those two benefits. And you could stop there and that could be a very good um, design speaker because then you can integrate that to the woofer's dispersion. But it is also limited in thermal capability and it is limited in low frequency um, capability, but also how far down in frequency can you control it? Now that's where we start talking about the beam forming um, and, and how we look at horizontal versus vertical directivity control. So by adding the, the two mid tweeters, if you will, above and below, more or less superimposed on that waveguide, you've taken the waveguide tweeter design and now you can extend the band with another octave um, and actually take the distortion even lower. And S7, for example, the lowest distortion point is in that really, really critical 800 to 2 kilohertz range. Um, that's the lowest point of distortion. But all that's now being controlled by these really lightweight transducers. At the same time, now you've extended the, the vertical control in you know, how, the, how the wave front's coming off the speaker. It's limited to you know, plus or minus 20, 25 degrees, which is plenty to cover your seating but it's, it's narrow enough to start eliminating some of the ceiling and floor reflections. That's the, that's the heart of the beam forming. Then as you look at, you can kind of see the picture behind me, Oop, wrong arm. Uh, as you add the woofer pairs, you extend that beam forming another octave and another octave lower. So effectively you could keep expanding that array and get the beam forming lower and lower frequency. So to kind of put it all together, an S7, will beam form down to close to two, 300 Hertz. Um, and S5 is more like five, 600 Hertz. Um, so that kind of shows you, and there's a close up on the- uh, I put a picture up so people can see yeah. it clo more closely. Yeah, so, so you can kind of see the, the symmetry um, is part of what makes it work. Um, so you use, you use the advantage of the, the geometry, the positioning, and then within the crossover, it becomes a rather complex crossover, but, but how you use each pair um, together allows you to, to, to control that vertical pattern. Are the three tweeters identical or is the center tweeter the only one that's the beryllium and the other ones aren't? They're very similar in uh, motor structure design, but the, the beryllium is the only one in the center. And then the, the two mid tweeters are made out of the same texture material as the woofers. Mm -hmm. And that mainly because they didn't need to play. They're, they're pretty much done by four kilohertz. Um, it's pretty complex how they're actually used from 1k to 4k um, that's how the beam forming works that's why when people say are you using a link with riley or butterworth crossover and, and i say no because it's those aren't the we're not trying to make electrical ideals we're trying to make the outcome in the room acoustically happen and then the components the crossover points and all that kind of follow within reason right you can't make a tweeter play at 500 hertz or whatever yeah now, there's uh, one thing I think you forgot to mention on the S7T limited edition is there's slightly increase in cabinet volume, right? Yeah, there is. So that was part of getting that extra energy below 80 hertz. Uh, we are we are getting a little bit more volume, not a ton. And then, of course, it's tuned just a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. So all that with with slightly different parameters of the woofer, you can, you know, as you work, the, and that's what's so great about designing the woofer for the speaker is now those those parameters of that driver are meant to work with that enclosure and, and we were able to unlock just a little, little different response. So if you've, if you've seen our anechoic measurement in Gene, I know you have, 
is mm -hmm. the way they roll off. Um, it's a vented box, but it actually reacts like a sealed box. So it's a real shallow 12 BB per octave roll off. And the reason behind that is so how it reacts with the room, the room game, it, it takes advantage of uh, quite well. But what we found is on the limited now, if we give a little extra energy in there uh, before it rolls off, um, it'll couple with the room and you get a little bit more base capability from it. Uh, but, but the key is really that roll off uh, with a vented box. The temptation is to tune it higher to show a curve that has more injury in that area. But then, but then when it rolls off, it rolls off at 24 dB per octave and it doesn't take advantage of the room gain the way it should. And the transient behavior is, is quite different and the, the sound quality is quite different. So it's, again, that's an evolution of many, many years of designing. But for us, that's always worked the best of how it reacts with the room. And then when you get feedback on people listening with different types of music, you get much more consistent results as opposed to it sounds great with this track and it's over bloated with that track, um, which we're to totally trying to avoid. Right. Someone's asking here, what kind of wattage would you recommend running these speakers? Um, three to 600 is, yeah. is the current. Yeah. Once you get to 300, you can, depending on your room size and your, your needs, um, uh, you can get quite good performance. And someone's asking, are the screws visible on the front? No. Um, so that was one of the changes we did. Actually, the best way to show it is the woofer. That's the trick behind the woofer is now everything's hidden underneath. Sweet. So we mount it, and then we have the rubber gasket go over it. Yeah, just a cleaner look. Same with the waveguide. You can't see the screws on the waveguide. Yep. Shout out to Drew. Oh, I put the wrong one up. Sorry. Well, we can answer that. How come there's no R7C or R7I? <laughs> don't have a great answer for that other than when you build something of that um, scale, right, of that size, you know, the market, you, you worry about the diminishing market demand. Um, for the S, it seemed very obvious to have those products. Um, yeah. But then the R series, it's just not clear yet. Um, it's something we could easily add. But at this point, um, the, the line is pretty broad and we cover a lot of a lot of needs. So, yeah. That's that's the basic reason. All right. Someone's saying is the tweeter waveguide designed in house. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's that's I'm laughing. I'm chuckling because um, every now and then you get comments. Oh, those speakers come from company X, Y, Z and blah, yeah. blah, blah, which is not true. I mean, that's that's the DNA of Perlis. And um, I've been designing ground up transducers almost 30 years. Um, you know, I was doing FEA modeling with a Pentium 100 processor, you know, Damn. pretty, pretty killer computer back in the day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, now your uh, iPhone kills it. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the DNA for listeners. We, we ground up everything and, and that's where Eric um, comes in um, where I, I do the geometry design and I have a lot of experience um, with the waveguides and things like that. Eric has the ability to do the multi-physics modeling. And so that's where something very complex with multiple transducers on a waveguide, what's that gonna do? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a total mess to begin with um, and you have to refine that. And that's where the, the simulations take you a long way um, so that when you actually do that first prototype, then you have a good idea of what this thing should do. Like for example, the lowest frequencies, those three transducers, almost act like a point source. So you have huge benefits there. Then it's, okay, where should they posi be positioned? Even the grill geometry, we spent time doing the simulations on, on the grills over those mid tweeters. That's a big part of it because that's part of the waveguide. And the tweeter needs to see a continuous waveguide to work properly, yet those mids have to be positioned there to, to work properly for the beam forming. So it's, it's, yeah, it's not off the shelf by any means. It's uh, very custom. Would you call your speaker phase coherent and time coherent? Or does it matter? Because that's always uh, been a debate with audio files for decades. It, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. I, I'd like to say the wavefront is coherent. Um, I don't have a specific uh, measurement to point you to that would say, okay, you can see everything is time aligned. Um, but essentially, um, the way the, 
the symmetry of the, the speaker and then the way the uh, crossovers are all blended in, essentially you get a coherent wavefront, um, which means the phasing between all the drivers have to, to have to line properly at the cross points to work, et cetera, et cetera. But not on the, um, if you're familiar with how Teal used to design speakers, they put a lot of emphasis on the time alignment and making the impulse, um, but they used uh, first order crossovers. And so there's yeah, you know, a lot of trade offs. Yep. Yeah. And where, you know, how can you cross a tweeter with a first order down at, you know, 1100 hertz? It's not going to happen. A lot of distortion. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I know when I did measurements in my room, that's why I was asking because I ran wavelets in REW, which is like a waterfall, but it gives you very accurate frequency domain and time domain behavior. And it was a straight line from 20 kilohertz all the way down to the room transition frequency of about 300 hertz. Yeah. So that was impressive to see. I mean, like I said, I've only seen that really in active speakers. So the fact that you're doing this with a passive speaker is pretty remarkable. That that's a great measurement. And it's one that is intimidating to look at the first time, especially if you have one with all the, the time smearing. Yeah. Um, but once you understand what it shows and what you're looking for, it's a wonderful way to just in one simple picture uh, show the performance in the room. It's, it's pretty, I use it to align subwoofers and it's a, it's a good hack. And in that REW. Yeah. So the last question I have for you is, is why did you stick with domes as opposed to compression drivers? Is there a reason do you feel like compression drivers would pot potentially color the sound or do you just prefer working with domes or what? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's the best way, um, so if you're trying to talk, take advantage of um, each geometry, each um, transducer, waveguides, things like that, there's pros and cons. And I started talking about tweeters, waveguides, et cetera. A, com a large compression driver, like a two inch with a one inch exit on a waveguide might in theory solve a lot of what we were talking about, but the side, the negatives, I, I haven't heard one that, has the finesse, the clarity, the the detail of the dome tweeters that we do. Um, sometimes um, you get such high pressure in those compressions, you get, I think it's called wave steepening, but essentially you get like a Doppler distortion from, from such high pressure levels in the compression driver mm -hmm. that out, the net is it doesn't sound um, nearly as good. So by using the three transducers, you know, we're at 110 dB sensitivity with the with the waveguide and the three transducers. That's essentially what the compression driver and waveguide would do. So yeah. we're doing all that, but now we have the ability to do the beam forming. So we've actually unlocked benefits over the compression driver and don't have the negatives of the sound quality. Um, and to put a little more detail on that, I, I have done um, designs with the, the compression drivers, uh, mainly for the pro space. And um, it's funny, I, I did one that had a great, spin around a, you know, the CTA 2034 and you look at the curves and they look quite good. And that's, that's where this is a little bit of a double-edged sword where the temptation is to look at the, the family of curves and go, it's a great speaker and just be done. But that's, that's dangerous. And I proved it to myself several times within the S7 project alone, but with those compression drivers, the curves look really good, but I would never have presented that as a high fidelity speaker. It certainly had good output good qualities and how it reacted um but it you know there were just so many other sound quality drawbacks that you didn't see in this in the in the spins um within that within like an s7 design some of the early renditions you know they hit they checked all the boxes on what we wanted to do in the polar response but how i was using the mids um i was actually creating a lot of distortion and it came up when we were listening to it it, it was good but then when you get to a point um, it had problems. So it took some refinement to stay within those parameters of what you want the, the spins to come out as, but yet have all the high fidelity. So it's, it's a trick. You always have to listen to the product and, you know, AB it, make sure that it, it, you know, it meets the goal. Yeah. I think that's a, you hit a good point. That's actually worthy of another live stream is you can't necessarily determine how good a speaker sounds just by looking at it, one graph. And there are people online that do that. They listen with their graphs. And in, in my opinion, you use measurements to make sure you're designing the thing properly. You make sure everything is summing correctly. You yep. make sure there's low distortion. But at the end of the day, you've got to listen to it in a real room in a controlled environment and make sure it's, it sounds right. 
I couldn't agree more. And you know, those curbs you can weed out quick though, for sure. Yeah. You can, okay. It's got problems already. Let's get rid of that. And you know, and that's certainly part of the design process. If you don't meet that standard initially, it's not worth going to the next step. Uh, but you're right. It hundred percent agree that, you know, what do we use these for? We listen to music. So you better, you better listen to music on them before you, you make your judgment. Yep. Got a shout out here for dream media. Great episode. Nice work giving back. Love it. Um, let's see if there's Thanks anything for else. Support, or... For those guys that do listen with graphs or all those graphs on your website. <laughs> they are. That's one thing that Dan does is he actually discloses measurements. Kudos yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, I, I don't even know exactly how we came to that conclusion. Um, maybe it was, I think largely it was because, um, a, we knew we had good measurements to show and B we weren't sure being a new brand, how we would be accepted. Um, oh, this is a great speaker. Well, why is it a great speaker? And if someone asked me, you know, one of the first places I'll start is by talking about the technology underneath it. Um, but, but in the end, yeah, you do have to listen to it, but, but that data supports the performance. It really does. Uh -huh. um, so that's why we publish it. And that's, that's part of us now. And that's why um, with these limiteds, we're going to, we're going to give actual data of the actual speaker um, to the owner. we got someone here crying over here. You got to see this one. What a bummer. The S17 is my absolute end all speaker. I've been looking for it, but not ready to buy just yet. And now the dream limited one comes out and I'll miss out. Gonna have to cry myself to sleep. Look what you're That's doing. Awesome. Dan. <laughs> Sorry, I think. <laughs> Someone's asking about the impedance curve. Um, it should be pretty similar to the S7 T, right? Or maybe a little lower in some areas. Yeah, exactly. There'll be subtle differences um, just to make everything um, some together. Um, I mean, if it's THX, it's got to, it, it shouldn't dip below 3.2 ohms or does you, it go? You're correct. Um, yeah. It's, it's, so you have a, a, a basement. Look, don't use a Marantz receiver to run a speaker like this. I mean, even the, maybe with the exception of the SR8015, but if you're buying a speaker like this, amplifiers power is cheap these days, get a dedicated amplifier. It'll make these speakers come alive. That's really the bottom line to it. So I think we're pretty much wrapped up. I don't have any other questions unless uh, Shane or Zach or Kellen, do you guys want to have any closing comments? I can't wait to set some of these up. I mean, you've created a real beauty here, Dan, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on today. Oh, you bet. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving yeah, me and I, I don't think we've, I don't think we've spoken since we officially got Perlison on board. So glad that, uh, Glad we were able to make that happen. And uh, yeah, I couldn't be more excited. So thanks for hopping on to you, Dan. And Dan, I think you need to make actually 51 pairs and have one in, in matte black finish because I know Shane Lee's going to want to pick up a pair of those. <laughs> so is that the takeaway? <laughs> I think that's the bottom. That's why he's asking about that matte black. Yeah, we could take the carbon fiber off, paint it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this live stream. Dan, it's always great to have you on. We're going to definitely have to do this again soon. Zach, Kellen, awesome to have you guys on as a channel sponsor. And I also love having Shane on these chats as well. Guys, if you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel as well as Shane Lee's Patreon channel. Hey, he needs to get some extra funds so he could buy some of these S7T limited edition. Let's hook up Shane so you know he can get some extra spare change. <laughs> Very cool. All right, guys, that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Thanks, Gene.